Okay. So number four, we want to uh, basically follow the order of operations, but we don't have numbers in there, so we can't exactly always add things together uh, unless they're like terms. So this guy here is a group of parentheses. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at those parentheses. Normally, when there's parentheses, we combine things inside the parentheses, or maybe there's something to distribute into the parentheses, or maybe the parentheses is being divided by something, or three raised to the power. All these different things could be happening to the parentheses, acting on the parentheses. Is there anything acting on the parentheses? Anything happening to the parentheses? Something to distribute, a power, or divide it by something? No? There's nothing there. Can we put anything together inside the parentheses? These go together? What do they make? It would be a negative, or no, it would be five. Yeah, five x to the second, or? Hmm. Five x to the third? Mm -hmm. Question mark? Let's start with, uh, let's get rid of the negative part. Let's just ask ourselves, can addition somehow combine an x squared and an x? And then we'll move on, if that's possible, we'll move on to 2x squared, 7x, or whatever it is. By this reasoning, it seems like we should get x to the third. It kind of seems yeah. like it makes sense, except for why, why do we now see that x squared can't add or subtract with x? Because you're multiplying 2x's instead of adding them all. You're multiplying 2x's? Yeah. So you can't just add another x in there because... All uh, right, to get it, to get that third x in this case, we need to what with the x? Multiply. Multiply. But here we are. We have three x's, but we're adding that third x. Mm -hmm. And this would apply with, with anything, like x to the fifth plus x to the seventh is not x to the twelfth. And x squared plus x is not x to the third, and so on and so on. Could I change just a little something on this side and get x to the fifth and x to the seventh to, to go together and make x to the twelfth? Is there just a little thing that I could change? Tyler? Um, the addition to multiply. Let's just oh. change that. Of course, it's not at all the same as what it, what it was. But now these do combine. When we multiply it all together, they are equal. So we have here, we have five x's. Let's pretend that's five x's. And then we have seven more x's. How many x's are we multiplying together? 12, seven, and then five more, 12 x's all multiplied together. Okay. Real close attention to that. Can't do that. Can't, uh, can't add, and then somehow the exponents uh, change. So back to the parentheses, can we put those together? We add those terms together in any way. And I have a negative number of x squared. I have a, a positive 7 number of x's. You know what? Those are just two different things. Can we talk about um, how they're in different dimensions? Okay. All right, so let's pretend this length represents x. X is some amount of feet, or even just one foot, to make it easier on ourselves just to think about. If this is X, how could I like, use this length to show you X times X? Kind of a tricky thing, because if I asked you to see, if I said that this length was And I wanted you to show me three squared, three times three. Then you could just draw three groups of three, right? That's three times three. To do that with x, though, how many is x? How many of these things do I put? Do I have to, I would have to put x in them, but I don't know what x is. Right? We can use similar triangles and things like that to pull this off, but it doesn't really help us see how different x and x squared are. Another way to show x squared, let's say we put an x along here, right? This length of x and here. Ourselves. What kind of shape is that? Square. It's the same on all four sides, right? And it's got 90 degree angles. It's a square. The area of this triangle is x times x. It's x squared. Okay. 
So you, if you try to add x plus x squared, we already have a problem. We know that that can't go together with x cubed. But just to see how different they are, you just can't say I have one ruler and one piece of paper, so I have two ruler papers. So it doesn't combine, right? And even more different, maybe if it's more different, I don't know if it's more different, but how would we show x cubed, x times x times x? Yeah, you would draw a cube and then have a side, bottom, and then like width. Right. This is our x by x, so that like the face of it is like this piece of paper here. But then we multiply that by a depth of x, a third dimension of x. And the inside of this thing, the, what do we call that? Measurement? This is the area, this is the? The volume. The volume, yeah. We, we can fill this area with little squares. We can fill this volume with tiny cubes. Right? Are we talking about like cubic inches or cubic feet? Like now I know that x doesn't always represent inches or feet or even a length. It can, it can represent uh, it can represent an area, right? It can represent square feet. That could be the variable we're solving for. But this is just a picture showing you how different. If this is x, then x squared looks like this, and if this is x squared, then x cubed looks like this. Just to show you how they're, like I said, literally, literally in different dimensions. One dimension, just a length. Two dimensions, an area. Three dimensions, a volume. So to try and add those together, collect those up, and get uh, one of those and one of those and one of those is three of something. You see, it's like apples and oranges. It's kind of like the the not having a common denominator. So here's all that. And so we cannot put these together. And it's not being multiplied by anything. We don't have to distribute anything into the parentheses. Uh, we're not dividing. There's just nothing to do. This parentheses kind of serve no purpose. Right? There's no combining. There's no distributing. We'll just leave this as 2x squared plus 7x. Because whether I take this number plus this number and then start subtracting, whatever that is, or, or I, oh, I don't have parentheses around it, I just order from left to right, it's not going to make any difference. If it really bothers you at all, you can distribute a positive one into the parentheses and just be done with it. Right. So we have found what this parentheses produces, and then uh, we're going to find out what this little group makes, and we're going to be adding them together. They're going to be on the level of addition and subtraction as opposed to multiplication, which is what we mistakenly do sometimes after we distribute, and then somehow we wind up with multiplying the, like, the two groups together. Just be careful of that. When I distribute this negative to the negative 5x, I'll get plus something. Plus what? Negative 1 times negative 5x. Negative 5x. Pause. Oh, yeah. Negative 1 times negative 5x. Distribute that negative 1 uh, also to the negative 8. Plus 8. Distribute that negative 1 to the negative 4x squared. Then we collect like terms, so we'll just start from the highest power and work down. We've got x squared there, x squared there, 2 from 4, that leaves us with 2x squared. We've got a 7x and a 5x, that's 12x. And then 8 is the only constant, so just 8. Okay. If I ever skip pages too quickly, or see your hand raised or you had another question, just let me know. Dealing with a function, a pretty simple function. We plug something in for x, we take the square root of x, and whatever that winds up being, we call that y. So we keep track of the input and the output. So we put 0 into this function. What's the square root of 0?
go ahead and do um, like nine. Let's do nine. Um, so if I want to plug negative three in for x, I don't know if I said this or not, but when we plug negative three in there for x, there's like these implied parentheses around x, meaning you need to square whatever x is, whether I'm positive or negative, or even if it's some quantity like four plus three, or we get all kinds of crazy. But probably the most complex thing we're gonna deal with is there's a negative there, and the negative also needs to be part of the, the thing that's getting squared. To make sure that happens, we put parentheses wherever we see an x, and if you think about it, there's really an implied parentheses around x, and all we're doing is removing the x from the parentheses, replacing it with the number. So we'll replace the x with the negative three. The whole thing goes in the parentheses. This whole thing goes in that parentheses. So we make sure that we, in this case, we don't get negative nine. We should get positive nine. Negative three times negative three is positive nine. Minus 12, plus three. Three plus nine is 12, minus 12, that's it. again for negative 2. Negative 2 needs to get squared. Plus 4 times negative 2 plus 3. Negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. Minus 8 plus 3. That's negative 4. Plus 3 is negative 1. 0. Easy, right? All the x terms, anything that has an x that's multiplying it goes away. And we're left with 3. If we plug in a positive 2, it'd just be like this, except this would be a positive 8 instead of a negative 8. So we would get 12, 15. And when we plug in 3, it would be just like when we put in negative 3, except we will wind up getting a positive 12. We get 21, 24. You do that as slowly as necessary to make sure there are no mistakes. No small mistakes. Now you're gonna make them forever. So cure yourself of that. Yes. Oh, if we forgot to do the charts, can we just like do a pink slip? Mm -hmm. Just turn it in. Can we finish it up and turn it in the late box? Yeah. Yep. Okay. We won't lose any credit as long as all the work is done. Okay. Which means I want to see you working it out. I want to see the work of it. Okay. Any other questions from the worksheet? You're ready. You feel like an expert. Show me that you know what you're doing. That's what having no questions means. Um, I forgot my little. We're gonna pass in our homework and make sure that our uh, our desks look like this. This message. So we're going to evaluate this for negative 3, and just I really highly recommend that you use those parentheses until, I mean, actually write the implied parentheses until you're so good at it that you know you won't make any mistakes, okay? especially when we're squaring or subtracting and we're supposed to subtract a negative, or if we're, um, yeah, whatever the case may be. So let's just train ourselves this way with parentheses, and we're sure we replace x exactly with negative 3 or whatever the number is. So, uh, so we got exponents, right? That's going to be first. So we're going to take negative 3 to the third, which means we're going to multiply what? 3 times 3. 3 times 3 times 3? Yeah. Negative 3 times oh, yeah. negative 3 times negative 3. Right. What's negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3? Negative three, so negative three, positive nine, and negative three, negative 27. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and write plus three, is that all right? Negative, negative, negative three. Yeah. Uh, four minus a negative 27, that's four plus 27, plus three, so that's 34 to me. So 
for those of you who made mistakes, just ask yourself, if you were to put the parentheses, take it slow, put the negative three in there, put the negative three in there, you could probably make fewer mistakes. I hope so. It's a really good, really good trick. Simplify. So find like terms, right? That's all we can do. You got a two x squared, you got a negative five x squared. You can put those together, right? Because they're both kind of like areas, right? Like when this is a paper, we can combine those and say how many of those things we have. So we have negative three of those. Two x's, like two rulers, just like x. And then four, just another four. That's as simple as it can be until we know what x is, and then we can plug something in for x, and then figure out what the final number is. Simplify, we're looking to do the parentheses first. Okay, you don't really do anything inside the parentheses, but the parentheses is being multiplied by three, so we need to, what's it called? Distribute the three. Distribute the three. Get three times x plus three times four. What are we going to distribute into here? Or you could distribute the 9x, but then you've left the negative there, so you need to leave a negative outside the parentheses and then distribute the negative. You could do it in multiple steps, it doesn't really matter. As long as you do it correctly. And remember we have addition here, right? So whatever we get when we distribute, we're gonna add. Whether we positive or negative. So plus negative 9x times x. But it's negative. Negative 9x squared. And negative nine x times one, just negative nine x. Now we collect like terms. Negative nine x squared, that's the only one around. And then we got a negative nine x and a positive three x for a negative six x. And then plus 12. Complete the table. We did a couple of these in the homework questions, so this should be easy to deal. X squared plus two times x minus one. So this time I want x to be negative two, so I'll put negative two in there for both of those. Negative two times negative two is positive four. Uh, two times negative two is negative four. Minus one. That's zero. squared, positive one, minus two, minus one, so it's a negative two. And zero, that's zero, that's zero, we have a negative one. If you put in a one, then you know, we're just gonna get one plus one times two, so we're just gonna really get one plus two minus one, so this is a positive two. Here, we'll just go ahead and do two squared plus two times two minus one. Four plus four minus one.
Functions, a very simple thing. It's a two-part definition. We're only going to worry about the first part right now. Later, we'll, we'll define exactly what a function needs to be. Uh, but this thing is a function. And it, the, the, all it needs to have, the properties that it needs to have to be a function, is that you can put a number in there and get a number out of there. All right? That's it. Put something in, you get something out. Uh, the other, quickly, the, the second part of the definition is when you put something in, you only get one thing out. You can't get like two things out or zero things out. And that's all that is. That's all the second part is. We're going to concentrate on the first part. That is, you put something in, and you get something out. And we did that with the table, correct? We did some examples of that. Did we talk about how the vending machine is a, is a mathematical function? Put a dollar in, you'll beep boop on the buttons, and you get something, right? Whatever it is that you chose to get. Uh, what else is an example of a function, kind of like a vending machine? Or um, anything. Let's say a pop machine does the same thing. A fine. <laughs> you got a candy machine. I was referring to a candy machine. A, a pop soda machine. If you're from my neck of the woods, soda machine. I laughed the first time I drove here. I got here at like 2 in the morning uh, on, a, on a Saturday, and uh, I stopped at a gas station. And I knew they said pop here, but it said pop. It, was written on a gas station window. That made me laugh. I didn't, like, didn't know it was that official. It was in writing everywhere. But it is. It is in writing. Yes. Um, would arcade machines be a function? Uh, it takes yeah, I, I mean, the uniqueness of the outcome mm -hmm. is kind of hard. But yeah, it gives you, you put in a certain number of quarters, it oh. gives you opportunity. It gives you a certain number of lines or what have you. Oh, and yeah. Game. yeah, so that's a function. Okay. Depending on how good you are, if you <laughs> play for longer or I'll, I'll yeah, girl, what was the answer? Hmm. I don't know. I got my space. A gambling machine. A gambling machine, you put in a certain number of quarters, and you get to pull the handle, and then maybe it was something out. What you really, the output of it really is uh, the, that allows you to play, right? And then, and then the, there is a function, like given a certain number, the combination of uh, whatever comes up, those three spots, it will give you back something, and something unique. Like it's not different. If you get three three bars, you get back a certain like percentage of the money that you put in. Right? Would a crane machine be one? Like if you're on your side of the Yeah, if we view it as like I input money and it gives me a chance to play, that's a function. Right? What you get out as far as like a, a toy well, that's a little bit trickier than a vending machine. Yeah, because a vending machine you win every time, right? It's like the easiest game to play. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes it's messed up and it's you have to shake it. I think it's like two people a year are killed by vending machines. Probably like how? Killed? How? How? Because they get stuck and they rock it and then it falls on them. <laughs> In a country of 300 million people, you have to three times a year. Okay, I believe it. It's not worth 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 it. Okay, so these are all examples of, of functions. You put something in and you get something out. So that's it. All right. Now, the reason we wind up getting these tables and these graphs and all this kind of stuff is because the only reason is because we want to keep track of the things that we get out when we put certain things in. I want to be able to quickly have reference to say, I put this in for x and I got this out for y. That's it. That's all a graph is. Very, very, very simple. Okay. So if you knew nothing about what the graph of this function should look like, which you probably don't. You might, but you probably don't uh, have a picture of this in your head, just off the top of your top of, the top of your head, just by looking at it. Okay. As we progress throughout the year and, and also throughout the two, we will have a better idea of what, which kinds of equations make what kinds of shapes when you graph. Right? The shapes are only made by an infinite number of points. Let me show you what I mean by that. We bring in a, a graph, um, and we plot these points. That's just getting us started. It's just getting us started. So we'll get uh, negative 2 comma negative 1. The thing that you need to be careful about, actually, I want to see if you are careful enough to plot these points and not get mixed up. So I, I want to see in your notes, just plot all of these points, OK? So, in case you're not sure, this is the x-axis. This is where we keep track of which x we put in. 
this is the y-axis. This is where we keep track of what came out for y. Okay, and this is positive, and this is positive horizontally. This is negative vertically, negative horizontally. And just to give you the first one, negative 2 for x. On the x-axis, I go to negative 2. And on the y-axis, I go down to negative 1. And that tells me that when I put a negative 2, I get out negative A couple of a couple of people getting the x and the y mixed up, all right? But not every time. So just be really careful. Uh, this is your x. This is your y. So x we move to the left one, and then for the y we move down two. So I'll put a mark down there. All right. Here, especially when there's a zero involved, that, that those are really commonly mixed up. Zero for x meaning should I go this way? No. Should I go this way? No. no. It's just right there in the middle as far as x is concerned, the horizontal. Then, for the y, I go down to negative 1. All right, we get a 1 for x and 2 for y. And 2 comma 7 means go to the right 2 and up 7. So, so far, we've done great. We have given some examples of, well, I'll ask you this way. Because this point being in this place, there's only you know, one place on the entire, what's called the Cartesian coordinate system, that is 2 comma 7. So us putting a point right there, what does that tell us about what we're looking at on this page? Not telling us anything like uh, two dollars or gallons or anything specific. You're just telling something about the numbers, about this function. Um, it increased from, I guess, the previous point. But what does this point, just all by itself, tell you about the function? Positive. If the function's positive, I, I guess it does tell you that. It does tell you that it's positive. It's at positive seven. When I look at this point, I know that it's at 2, 7. What is the fact that it's at 2, 7? No. First one's x, second one's y. Okay. So what what did I, I mean, what does that tell me about this, like this equation right here? solution. That is a solution to the equation. That's a good point. Uh, that's even more advanced than what I'm looking for. Like if we find an x and a y that's, it's what's called satisfies the equation, then we found what's called the solution. It is a solution to that equation. But as far as a function is, remember we taught, said a function is defined as what, something that you can, like a bending machine or a pop machine or what? What do we say a function was? Like? Seth? Whatever you put in, you get out. OK, you put something in and something comes out. Yeah. Just the way you said it makes it sound like whatever you put in, that's exactly what comes out. Like if I put in 4, I get out 4. Right? something. Yeah. You do get something like the, the function dictates what you get out, right? So I'm not trying to pick on you too much. Just the way you said it sounds like if I put in something, that's what I get out. It's the same thing that I put out or put in. So a function is something you put something into the function, you get something out of the function. That's why a vending machine is a function. You put in money and you, you press the buttons and you get something out. This is a function because I put something in. Where do I put something in? Well, okay. Just talking about the equation at the moment. Where do I put something into this equation? X. Into x. X is typically our input. Like 99 times out of 100, x will be the place where you put something in. And where do we get something out? Y. y. The output is y. So we put stuff in here, it goes through, and it becomes y. Um, so, as we come back down to the graph, what does this point tell me about that input-output of the function? Yeah. 
maybe x and y equal to 7. x and y are 2 and 7. x and y are 2 and 7. That's what the 0.27 tells me. There it is. Right? I'll put in 2, you got out 7. All right? So the, the graph, it, it tells us what the function's doing. And we, we don't maybe quite know how it did it, but the graph is telling us. If we put in 2, we get out 7. That's really all we want to know anyway, so that's why we put it on a graph. Because when we put it on a graph, we actually get to track a lot of these inputs and outputs for a very small amount of space. And if I were to continue this, this t-chart out, this table out, to get more you guys stop. To get more inputs and outputs, to know, okay, if I put in three, will I get it? When I put in five, what will I get? If I put in negative four, what will I get? If I put in 0.5, what will I get? Right? That would start to take up a lot of room. But if I put it on a graph, one tiny point tells me what this tells me, right? That number two and the number seven. Just this little tiny point in that position tells me that same piece of information. Okay? Could I also go on and do like, uh, like go in between one and two, let's do 0.5. Can I put in 0.5 in this function? So do we anchor it, right? Can I put 0.25 in this function? Sure I could. Do the computation, I get the output, okay? What if I said that I get uh, eight? If I put in 0.5 and I get out eight. What would you say about that? Did you believe it? No. Why would you believe it? Can you do that? It's like putting in two quarters, you get out of eight dollars. Okay, maybe that happens. Are you, okay, yeah, that's what I mean. So, um, and then you go with the pattern. Uh, looking at the graph, or even at the numbers, but looking at the graph, I certainly can see if, if one gives me out two, and two gives me out seven, I just don't believe that 0 0.5 will give me a, an eight, right? That the point that I get for the graph would just land up here. Look at the rest of the graph. Look at this point, this point, this point, this point. It seems to not fit the pattern. Seth? Or how would you plot 0 0.25? 0 0.25? Not very accurately. Okay? Um, oh, I put 0.5. Not 1.5, excuse me. That makes it fail. Not up there, but here. That just seems to be accurate. How would you plot 0.25? You would just kind of guess. X is 0.25 is. Well, there's about a half. I can estimate that pretty well. So half of half would uh, be right about there. So it's just kind of a guess. Kind of eyeball. Yeah. If we were really accurate or we had a computer drawing this graph, it would be a little better. A lot better. Uh, if we had a ruler and we were being really precise, we had a really sharp pencil, we could draw a really good graph. So no, I don't. I just don't believe that 0.5 will give me eight. Uh, would you believe it if I said that? 0.25 gives you negative 3. 0.25, negative 3, it doesn't seem very likely. It just doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to fit the pattern. Now, if we put 0.5 in there and we did get out 8, and we checked it, and we checked it again, and it just, it just gave 8, well, then I guess that was kind of unexpected, but, uh, well, it's kind of, it's, it's weird. But, in reality, no, I, I know this function is not going to give us 8 when we put in 0.5. It's not going to give us negative 3 when we put in 0.25. But what if I told you that it gives you, when you put in 0.5, something more like uh, 0? Would you believe that it could maybe give you 0 or something close to 0? Mm -hmm. 0.5 is right here, the x. If, the, if it gave you 0, that means it would give you a point on the x-axis. Yeah, that's believable, okay? So what I'm trying to draw your attention to is what the rest of this graph is. When we get to the point where we stop plotting points and we start drawing a shape, I want you to understand what it means when you draw the shape. Because that is the part that seems to cause the most confusion and, and take away so much meaning from what a graph is from the computer. When we draw that shape, what we're doing is saying, this is where I think all of the other points are going to land. Right? I'm not going to draw a shape that's like this up to that point at 0 0.58, 0 0.5, 8, because I don't believe that that point would be there. 
I believe that's what would happen. I would buy that 25 gives you zero. Maybe it doesn't, but it's got to be pretty close. So I think that that's probably there. If I put in 0.75, I bet you it gives me something out, like 1.1 1 .1 maybe, I don't know, something close to that. If I put a negative, or sorry, 0.25, I think it would probably give me some number that's well, it's between zero and negative one, I'll bet, it's, it's something like that. If I were to put in some number between 0.5 and 0.75, I think I'd get a number out that's like that, okay? You see what my, my thought experiment is about? I think this is where all these points are gonna and if I do this enough times, I make enough guesses, and I plot enough points, what do I start to get? Yeah. Now, I think you can see that this whole thing's not going to be a line, right? it's going to be a curve. But yeah, we start to get a, a shape, like a connect the dots kind of a shape. And if I were to guess at where all the other points are from here to there, it would look, start to look even more curved. and I bet this would just kind of curve up there. All of the infinite number of points that I could plot in between those two points would start to meld and melt and mush together and the spaces between them would be so tiny that I couldn't even tell the difference anymore between this point and that point and it would start to make this curvy shape. This curvy shape, again, is just the mushed together trillions upon trillions upon trillions If you get that, if you fully get that, then that's pretty profound whether or not you realize it. It's pretty important, it's very important. Okay. All the way through to my calculus class, if I could just fluidly talk with my students and say, if we put this kind of thing into this function, what kind of thing do you think will come out? Will it be a big number, a small number, a positive number, a negative number? We have to think about what we imagine will come out of the function very, very often. And also, if we don't know what a graph looks like, if we don't know what the graph is supposed to look like, we can always do what to get an idea of what it looks like? If you don't know what a graph looks like, where can you start? Okay. The x and y axis. Okay, you got to draw the x and y axes. Then I've got to know some point that is on the graph, right? So how do I find that point? You just start at the origin. Start at the origin. The origin is right there. Yeah. Okay. Here, let me. I mean, you do. I mean, you plot points if you start there. Maybe let ask it slightly differently. If I gave you this new equation. through that. I'm, I, I'm okay. very new to this. How would that go? So you want to input, um, like let's say if, if we were looking for x or if we were looking for y, you want to put in uh, the x's into the, like where the x's would be in the uh, equation and then find the answer to that and that would give you your y point. How do I know what to put in for x? You have to look at the graph. But I don't have a graph. Oh. Seth? You can simplify the expression. How so? that one? Which ones are you combining to get six? Two X. So two X and two X. Four X. 
Or yeah, yeah, another four X. Right there. Second though. Yeah. You you simplify the expression pretty much what you <laughs> Okay, well I'm confused because I, I feel like it's not simplifiable, so I gotta I gotta have you teach me how to simplify this expression. Maybe I don't think it is. It's not simplifiable? Why is it not simplifiable? It's not simplifiable. Why? Can I put that guy with that guy? So this is the third power, so. That matters? That makes a difference? No. It doesn't, or it does? Oh, you I gotta said, decide. I said it, uh, you're confusing me. <laughs> well, I'm, if, I, if I can confuse you, it means that you're not sure, right? Which means you have something to learn, which means seize the opportunity to, to learn this thing. Because we actually talked about this earlier, earlier today. Yeah. Right? Why can't I add this 2x squared to this 2x? get four of something. Okay, they're not like terms, that's true. They're very different things. They're like apples and oranges, we can't add them together. Can we elaborate it on a little, a little bit more? It's, it's saying, oh, well, they're not like terms, they have different exponents, and, and relying on us to re ourselves to remember that that's the thing, is what causes us to make mistakes in the future because you can just forget things that you remember. But if you understand what this is and maybe kind of what it looks like and what this looks like, you understand they're, not, they're so different I can't put them together. Um, like if you were trying to combine 2x to this uh, third and just uh, 2x, you can't do that because you're multiplying and not adding. So if I try to do like 5x to the fourth? Yeah. It's hard to even pretend that these can go together because, you know, because they can't. So yeah. to pretend like, like I know what this power should be, it's hard to say because it's not what's being created here. Um, because this is all multiplication, but this has addition in it, right? This is just, this is 3x cubed, so this is x cubed plus x cubed plus x cubed plus x plus x. And if you think of it, you can add x cubed plus x. Let's just look at that for a second. Can you add x cubed plus x? No, I mean, is, is that x to the fourth? No, because this is x times x times x times x, and this is just x times x times x plus x. Okay. Try to add together two x's of different powers. This is what you're doing. Basically, you're magically changing this plus into multiplication. You're magically exchanging the plus for multiplication. That can't be. So 2x cubed plus 2x, no, that doesn't simplify, they don't combine. 2x cubed times 2x, that's a different story. Okay. We'll worry about that a little later. But no, they're, yeah, in short, they're not like terms. They can't be added. So again, the question is, if I want to figure out what the graph of this looks like, where do I start? I gotta start somewhere. Talk about finding some points and plotting those points, and then I ask where do those points come from. Yes? Okay, just like plugging numbers. Which numbers? Make up numbers. Make up numbers, up. absolutely, right? This function, and you put things in and you get things out. What do you put into it? Anything that works. All right, there's no, there's no rules to it. Can I, do you see any problems? Just like putting one in there, is that gonna cause an issue? Putting in two, putting in three, negative seven. These are all possible, right? It is possible to plug these numbers in, no problems. So that's what we'll do. We just plug things in and see what comes out. And then when I put something in and I get something out, Whatever I put in, I will track on the x-axis. Whatever came out, I will move up and down in the vertical direction, and I'll put a point there. Right? Let's start easy. Let's put in like, what's the easiest thing you think to plug in for x? Zero. Zero, right? Because everything goes away, except for the things that don't have x multiplied by them. Zero, 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 negative one. So zero for x, negative one for y. Right? One's not too bad. Right? Because this is just going to be 1, 1, 1, you're going to multiply it by the coefficients. You're going to get 2 minus 4 plus 2, that's 0, right? Minus 1. 
So we also, when we put in one, happen to get out negative one. And that's where it starts. And how will you start to get an idea of the overall shape of the graph? Keep, keep, plugging keep plugging in numbers and figuring out what numbers come out and plotting those as points. How many points could you plot? Theoretically, infinite, an infinite number. When you're done plugging all those infinite number of points into the graph, plotting all those infinite number of points, what will it look like? Well, whatever the shape of the graph is supposed to be. That's what, what I really want you to understand is that the shape of a graph is not some magical property that you're supposed to just see uh, without knowing anything about the function. What the shape is, is just a mushed together infinite number of points. That's what the shape is. Does that make sense? Right. So when you go to draw the shape, you have to imagine where will all of the other points lie. I have done plotting points. I think I have a good guess of where all of the points that I could ever possibly plot will go. And so now I make my guesses. That's what, that's what you're doing when you're drawing the shape. You guess. And as we learn more about math, we'll make a more and more and more informed guess. This one, you know, should, I think maybe I'll, I'll get more points here, 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 and maybe have points come down in this direction? Possibly. Say, who knows? Possibly. Very good answer. Possibly. I'm not sure. That's fine. As we learn more about these kinds of functions, we will know whether or not that's what's supposed to happen. Right? Uh, if you don't know, what can you do to find out? Let's plot some more points. Where? Over here? Anywhere. Well, if I want to get an idea of does it go down like this, where would I plot? Over here somewhere, yeah. right? What kind of numbers are over there? Negative. Negative. I got negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative seven and a half. Anything I choose. And if I plug in, say, negative four, and I get something really big, I'm starting to feel like all the points will wind up being higher than that, and higher than that, and higher than that. Just keep going and going and going. Right. Can anybody plug in negative four and tell us what we get out? Why don't you all do that? Plug in negative four, see what you get out, and see if we all agree. I got seven. I put in negative four, I got out seven. Right. Make sure that when you substitute that negative four, you got the parentheses around the, uh, the, the x and you replace it with negative four, two times negative four. We got negative four squared is 16. This is going to be minus eight, right? Two times negative four is negative eight. So we got 16 minus eight, that's eight. Minus one is seven. So what do you think? Do you think it's going to go up and come back down? Well, no, it's at least got to go up to seven, right? All those, I would bet you all those points are kind of in a line from here to there, okay? But we don't want to draw with a line. We want to connect these with nice smooth curves. We don't want to make these jagged pointy things. I bet all the points between here will land somewhere along this curve. I might be slightly wrong. The actual curve might go like this, you know? You know what I'm saying? But something like that. Not something like this, probably, right? Probably not. What do you think? Does it come back down after that? No. It could, it could, it could, it could not. Let's try putting negative five in there. What do you get when you put in negative five? Go past that. Some, some of you put in negative five. How about these four? Put in negative eight. Put in negative eight. You guys put in negative five, and this four will put in negative eight. Seems are kind of unbalanced, but they're not really teams anyway, so let's see what happens. All right, negative five people, what'd you get? 14? Yeah. 14? 14. Yeah. 14. Uh, negative 5 squared, 25. Minus 10, 15. Minus 1, 14. Well, that's so far. That's, I mean, that, okay, I'll try. I'll try and plot that. But it's like twice as high as this. It's up into my chart. All right, does it, does it go up there and then come back down? Maybe. Maybe. Let's, let's ask the negative 8 people. What'd you get? 
47. We got 47. That I can't, I don't have enough room for 47. You think it goes up to 47 and comes back down? Probably not. Probably, Probably not. not. Do you see what happens there? Yeah. We get to some point where like 40, 40 what? Seven? Yeah. That's really high. I think if I put it negative nine, it'll probably be bigger than 47. If I go to negative 10, it'll probably be bigger than that. Oh gosh. And you're right about that. Your instincts about that are correct. Right. We'll think about it a little harder later in the year and kind of prove to ourselves that it would have to just keep going up. But for now, just 47 is so big that I just don't feel like it's gonna, I'm gonna start getting smaller numbers for some reason after that. Okay. Um, Great, so it seems like it's just gonna go like that forever, and I, I bet on this side it'll do that as well. I think so. In fact, here I got a, uh, you know, I got a negative one here and a negative one here. I got a seven here and a seven here. This even seems to be symmetrical. Mm -hmm. right? It seems like there's like a mirror right in the middle. So if this keeps going up, I'll bet this one does too. Right? And that's a good guess. Yeah. And it's correct, it happens to be correct. Let's go ahead and, yeah, we'll, we'll take a break for a few minutes. What can we plug into this function? Any number. Thank Numbers. you. Exactly. Any number. Okay. Now, if that seems like obvious, and of course you like, no matter what the equation, you can do anything you want. Let me just show you a function where you can do that. Okay. So a simple one. Y equals one over x. Can anybody think of any number you're not allowed to plug in for x? Zero. Who said zero? Zero, Tyler. Why? Why can't you plug in zero? Because you can't. One doesn't go into zero. Zero doesn't go into one. Zero doesn't yeah. go into anything. Uh -huh. right. Here, we, this is where we go back to the definition of a factor. We talked about it a long time ago. If something's a factor, it means that I can multiply it by something to get that number, right? Mm -hmm. So if zero goes into one, then I need to be able to take zero, multiply it by something, and get one. Yeah. No, that's not possible. So. No, you can't divide things by zero, right? At least that's, that's what we've been told. And it's, well, we've been told that because it is absolutely true. You can't divide by zero. It's called undefined. And there's other things you can't do. You can't take the square root of a negative number. You can't take the natural log of a negative number or zero. You can't do a lot of things in math. And when we write functions with these problems, and we try to put things in for x that we can't, then we get some problems. But this one, it's, it, I ask you, what number can you not multiply by three fourths? Yeah. Yeah. So you can multiply any number, absolutely any number by three fourths. Okay. So what I want you to do is uh, let's just talk about it real quick. What would be the easiest thing to plug in for x? Yeah. Absolutely. What do I get when I plug in zero? Zero. Yeah. Zero. Five. Then minus five. I get negative five. That's the output of the function, right? Here, let's start to keep track. X, y. Zero gives me negative five. Can I put that on a graph? Yeah. You bet I can. Now that point, in that very unique place on the, on the coordinate plane, tells me that if I put in zero to the function, I get out negative five. Can you think of a very easy thing, some other very easy number to plug in for x? One. No. Sure, one's not that hard. Three, anything times one is itself? Sure. So um, let's do that work. Three fourths then minus five, not chickening out and, and just plugging it in my calculator and getting a decimal. The common denominator, right, I need a denominator of four. So this will be times four, 20, or four. 20 divided by four is five, that's the same thing. Negative 17 over four, when I put in one. Do you want to graph negative 17 over four? No, I don't really want that. I like to graph things that are like zero, negative five, one, comma two, whatever. So, good, we plug in one, you got negative 17 fourths, but maybe we can avoid this weird fraction problem. Can we think of a, something we can plug in for x that is even easier than one, or even, well not easier than zero, that's too easy. Something that's easier than one. Negative one, negative one then we'll get negative three fourths, so we get yeah. negative three fourths minus 24, so that's not too hard. We, we can kind of work that out right now because this would just be negative, negative 23 fourths. Do you want to graph negative 3 fourths? No. Two. Put in 2. That's a little better because if I put 3 fourths in there times 2, what if what I multiply 3 fourths times 2 over 1? What do I get here? Um, 6. 6 over. Okay, 6 over 4. And 6 and 4. 
What about six and four? Three, 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 three over two. So at least it's not fourths. It would be easier to grab halves than it would be fourths. I mean, just really quick, this is going to be ten halves, right? Ten halves right here. Three halves minus ten halves is negative seven halves. That's, that's a little bit of that. I guess wouldn't fives be easier? Plug in a five? Yeah. Plug in a five for x. Y equals three fourths times five over one. I'll just put it over one because that makes it easier to look at. Minus five. Y equals, this is uh, 15 fourths minus five. That's 20 fourths. So now we get negative five fourths. Five, negative five fourths. What do you think about it? Um, would 25 be easier because like four times 25 is 100? Find out. Uh, put in, uh, would you say 25? Yeah, 25. Times 25 over 1 minus 5. So we get 75 over 4 minus 5. So 74, 75 fourths minus 20 fourths is uh, 55 fourths. Or you can find the mixed number for that, that'd be fine. So we have this fourth that we have to kind of guess at you know, on the graph. Any thoughts about any number that when you multiply it by three fourths, something a little bit nicer happens? And take a look at when we plugged in two, and I almost got there. Four. What happens if we plug in four? Almost. Y equals three fourths times four over one minus five. Twelve over four. What's what's the deal with twelve? Three. Yeah, easily goes in. Yeah, four goes into twelve. 12 is divisible by 4. 4 is a factor of 12. So do I have to find common denominators? No, because 12 divided by 4 is 3. I just subtract 5 from that. Get negative 2. 4, negative 2. Well, that's an easy point to plot. Negative 2, there it is. Awesome. What's another number that's easy to plug in for x? It's going to do the same thing. Get rid of that 4. 8, right? 8 has a factor of 4. If I multiply 8 by 3, I'm going to get something that's divisible by 4, right? Of course I am. If I put an 8, I'm going to get out something nice. I know this is looking like a mess. 3 fourths times 8 over 1 minus 5. You really got that cross-canceling thing going on, right? We talked about that. This is 2, so that's 3 times 2. That's 6 minus 5. That's 1. So I got 1 there. 8 becomes 1. Somebody else? Wouldn't it just be a multiple of four? Exactly. That's the conclusion we want to come to. Multiple of four, any multiple of four. Even negative multiple of four. Negative four, negative eight. Negative eight. Ah. What does this start? What, if I were to plot all the points in between these points, what kind of shape do you think would start to melt together? A diagonal line. A diagonal line. Like it doesn't look very curvy, like that other one we did, right? You ever graph lines before? Oh, not line graphs, but science, science graphs. Okay, well, this is fresh. That's great. It's, like, you've never seen this before. That's fine. Okay, so your homework is just finish up those graphs that were on that worksheet. Okay, finish up the graphs. So, yeah, If you here's the tricky thing. If you didn't do the tables, you wanted to put up the tables. Just make a little note on there, like here's my tables. Please go back and give me full credit for the previous assignment. Okay? All the same issues. Yes. What? Yeah, let me get those back. 